Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. All the night has been won, and I shall through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overflow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to him. Is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me.
right, go and take your Bibles tonight if you would and go to Matthew chapter 19 this evening. Matthew chapter number 19. Think about the song they sang and just think about the folks who were involved in Jesus' birth. It reminds us that he's not looking for the highest, the greatest, the richest. He's just looking for those who are willing to give what they have to give. And if they're willing to just give, it's amazing what God can do when he finds those who are willing to be used by him. Matthew chapter number 19, beginning at verse 27, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? It's quite the question that Peter has asked there. Peter's looking at what he has done. If you remember Peter as he was on the seashore, one day Jesus came and asked if he could have his boat and to launch out into the deep a little bit. And from there, Jesus would preach to the multitudes on the seashore. Jesus would then again ask Peter to lay down his fishing nets and to follow him. In doing so, Peter would be turning his back on his own father and his business. And Peter and Andrew both would follow Jesus from that day forward, and they would give their lives for the cause of Christ. And so Peter, as he is here early in the infancy of his ministry, if you will, as he is in, uh, for lack of a better word, in college, uh, he is getting prepared to go into the ministry when Jesus would leave. He asked the question, what shall we have therefore? Labor always requires a payment. Labor is if you were to have somebody come and work for you, and if you did not pay them, you would be considered very cheap. Uh, and we understand that principle. And so it is not too far-fetched from what Peter is asking. I've heard some kind of get on Peter for asking this question here. But Jesus does not uh, you know, take him and rake him over the coals or anything of that nature. Instead, Jesus takes the time to answer the question. And then he follows that up with a parable. Look at verse 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that, Ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first." For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out in early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour, and saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour, and did likewise." About the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came, that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Father, I pray that you'd help us tonight. I pray that you'd encourage us, Lord, to answer the call to serve you. Lord, I pray that you would show each and every one of us what it is you'd have us to do. And Lord, may we serve you faithfully 
with the lives that we have, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. In our country over the last few years since the uh, COVID outbreak as it has started, we have watched many businesses have to shutter their doors. And in the process of shuttering their doors and having to uh, wade through what was uh, considered a pandemic, uh, many of them tried to maintain things uh, through that time until the time came when they could open their doors once again. Many attempted to open their doors, but they found a problem. Many did not desire to come back to work. Many were more than happy to receive the free money that the government was handing out. Of course, we all know there is no such thing as free money. Somebody is paying the bill. Uh, and, but many have not come back to work. And because of that, we've watched many businesses and many places have to close their doors. And I've seen this over and over again over these last several months. Uh, we are closed due to a lack of help. They have reached out for help and they've asked for help and they've wanted help and they have tried to hire people on. But I've heard this over and over again as well, that those uh, that they have hired have come in for a day or two and they found out they did not like work as much as sitting on their couch and playing their video games. And so they never showed back up again. And we've watched this happen over and over again. And all across our country, we're watching different places deal with this, uh, this shutdown, if you will, and it's having this, uh, this adverse effect upon them. But much to the same uh, vein, if you will, as you think about this, we find that Christ, as He is putting forth this parable, He is, if you will, putting out a help wanted sign. He's looking for those who are willing to serve and help Him. Uh, if you will, on this parable that He gives to the disciples to help them understand uh, this here is that uh, there's a man who has some land that needs to be worked. And so he would go out at the beginning of the day. And if you understand the Jewish time frame, uh, the day always began at 6 a.m. And so this man would go out and in the courtyard of the area here, there was a place in town where uh, many of the workers would show up and they'd be waiting to be hired uh, to go out and do some work. And so this good man of the house, he comes out, he probably arrives about, I don't know, maybe 5.30, 5.45 to kind of look it over and see who all is around and see uh, who he can hire. And he begins to see some men that would work well. He thinks they would be able to bear the heat of the day and they'd be able to do the work that he has. And so he begins to hire those folks and, and he hits them them out into the field and they make an agreement, the Bible says. He says, they agree to be paid one penny. Now before you get bent out of shape and think that, oh man, he's a cheapskate, a penny was simply a day's wages. He pays them this here. So that's the agreement. He comes out back about 9 o'clock and realizing this group that he has uh, hired is not enough to get the job done. He asks and he says, is there anybody else left here in the, uh, in the marketplace? And maybe some guys overslept. Maybe they uh, slept in a little bit that morning and they came to the marketplace here a little bit later than everybody else. But there they are at 9 o'clock and he comes out and he says, uh, would any of you guys like to work for me today? And he says, we would love to get some work here in before uh, the day goes much further. He says, I'll tell you what, you go work for me and I'll pay you at the end of the day whatever is right. And they said, fine by us. And so off they went. Comes back at lunchtime at noon and he comes and he asks the same question looking for those men. He finds some more men there who are still waiting there. Uh, he comes back at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and he finds more men still waiting. And so he hires them on. He comes back at 5 in the evening. Five in the evening, there's only one hour of daylight left. There's only one hour left to work. And yet he finds these men here. And the Bible says that he asked them, why have you tarried here all the day long? And they said, no man hath hired us. It's an amazing question because from the tone that is given by this parable, it seems that Christ has, uh, has uh, made it sound like the good man has sought for help every time he has come. But these guys have never taken up the offer. He's been seeking for help all along. But these men did not until finally the 11th hour comes and they says, I'm still looking for help. Would you be willing to help me out? And he says, well, nobody's hired us up to this point. I guess we'll go and work for you. And he says, fine, go to the field and I'll pay you what is right by the end of the day. We know that at the end of the day he makes them, uh, he pays them all exactly the same. Now, obviously, if you've been working for 12 hours and you get paid the same as that guy who's been sitting in the marketplace for the last 11 hours and only has worked one hour, it might rub your fur the wrong way. Yeah. You might get a little bothered to know they're getting paid the same as you. But understand here, this was the agreement. He said to those who are starting the day off, I will pay you a penny. To everybody else it was, I will pay you what is right. 
It was left to the good man of the house to determine how much to pay. And here's Peter asking, Lord, we have left everything for you. Uh, what's in it for us? And what Jesus is trying to get through to Peter is, hey, just go and labor for me and let me take care of that. That's all I want you to do. I want you to labor for me and let me take care of those things. You'll find in Peter's life, he's often interested in what's going on in everybody else's uh, business. Yeah. Well, I, okay, I'm going to be crucified. Well, what about John? What's going to happen to him? It doesn't matter, Peter. I've called you to go and do this. And Peter was often concerned with those things there. But what Christ is trying to get through to Peter is this here. He says, look, Peter, I want you to know I'm hanging out a help wanted sign and I'm looking for help. Peter, are you willing to work for me? Peter, are you willing to serve me? Peter, are, are you going to be concerned and hung up with all these other things over here? Or are you just going to be willing to be my servant? And Peter had to come to a conclusion that day whether or not he was willing to serve the Lord and answer the call for help or if he wanted to go after his own agenda. Did he want to just serve for his own things? Uh, of course, we know that Peter did eventually make that choice. And he said, oh, Lord, I will follow you and I will be your disciple. I will be your instrument in your hand. And God used the Apostle Peter in a great and tremendous way. But right here in Matthew chapter 19 was a pivotal point in Peter's life. What's in it for me, Jesus? Peter, don't worry about what's in it for you. Be worried about serving the Savior. And that's what he's asking for all of us today as well, that we would do the same. Luke chapter 10 and verse number 2. Jesus said this here as He sent the 70 out. He said this, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray you therefore the Lord of the harvest that He would send forth laborers into His harvest. In John chapter 4 and verse 35, as the disciples came back from uh, the place there in Samaria, and they were busy buying food and overlooking everybody else, Jesus was uh, busy leading a uh, a Samaritan woman to Christ, one who was a divorcee five times over and was now uh, living in immorality, living with a, a man, and yet Christ was able to win her to Himself and then send her in, and she did more for the cause of Christ that day than all twelve disciples did. And as those men came back and they were amazed that Jesus would spend time with a Samaritan woman, here's what Jesus said to them. He said this, He said, uh, Say not ye, there are four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already unto harvest. He says, I need laborers to go into the field and labor for me. What is it that Jesus is looking for in a laborer? Can I tell you first thing? He's looking for those who are saved. If you're saved in here this evening, He's looking for you. If you're saved in here tonight, He wants you to labor in His vineyard. He wants you to labor in His field. Uh, I don't know what uh, place you have in that, in that field, but He wants every one of us. He said, well, you don't know my past. Can I just tell you, I don't know if anybody kind of reaches up to that Samaritan woman's uh, uh, level uh, of past or not, but can I tell you, He used her to do a great work in the city of Sychar. He's not looking for perfection. He's looking first off for those who are pardoned. Are you pardoned tonight? Do you have salvation tonight? He's looking for those who are saved to go out and to be a witness for Him. But you cannot be a good witness for Him unless you know what you're witnessing about. That's right. If you don't have salvation, you have nothing to tell anybody. You have nothing to offer to say, let me tell you how wonderful Jesus is. Well, have you been saved? Well, no, I haven't been saved. Then how do you know Jesus is wonderful? Well, I'm going by what the preacher said. Not good enough. Well, I'm going by what my mom and my daddy told me. Not good enough. Listen, you need to have a personal relationship yourself. Uh, if you're building your, uh, your relationship uh, uh, with Jesus Christ based on everybody else's experiences, you've got the wrong thing going. You've got to have a personal relationship yourself. But also this here, God is looking for this. He's looking for those who are willing, willing to serve Him. God is not interested in, 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 in overseeing a forced labor camp. That's not what He's about. He's not looking for those who are going out there uh, kicking and screaming and, and just kind of uh, you know, boo-hooing about all this. No, He's looking for willing servants. He's looking for those who are willing to go out and be what He wants us to be. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 that it's just our reasonable service to give ourselves to Jesus Christ after what He's done for us. 
It's just reasonable to do that. It's just, it's just reasonable that we would want to live for Him and give Him uh, our service. And, and He wants it out of a heart of love, not out of requirement. He wants our love first and foremost. God is looking for those who will labor for Him tonight. And listen, you understand that just because you decide to sign up and go and follow Him doesn't mean it's going to be an easy road. Any servant of Christ knows that uh, there are not, it's not a bed of ease. Uh, there will be those who will be uh, uh, alongside to help build, but also understand there will be those who will be, you'll have to battle against as well. Look with me at Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter number 14 tonight. Luke chapter number 14, and look with me if you would at verse number 26. Actually, let's start at verse 25. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them. So try to imagine, if you will, the hundreds of people that are thronging Christ to be close to him. He's healed the sick. He's, he, he's done amazing things. He has provided uh, so much for them. And there are just hundreds of folks following him. And he, in the midst of having this great surge of, of popularity, he turns and he gives them this wonderful message that's going to just draw many more to himself, right? No, look what he has to say there in verse number 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I don't think you're going to hear Joel Osteen preach that message. Listen, that's not a comfortable message. That is not a message that is self-serving. That is a message that I'm denying myself. I'm denying everything about me. Look at verse 27. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. A cross was not a pretty thing. I, we mentioned this the other night. The, a cross was not an ornamental thing. It was, a, it was an instrument of death. It was an instrument of a very cruel and terrible death. And what he is telling them here, he says, I, you need to lay aside your own agenda. You need to lay your own side of da, uh, down. And you need to come over. You need to pick up that cross. And you need to bear that cross. And listen, that was the typical thing of a convicted uh, criminal. He would have to pick up his own cross. And he would have to walk through town. And as they would watch him coming through, bearing that cross, they all knew he was a man who was co uh, uh, guilty of capital crimes. He was a man who was on his way to death. And he had no possible uh, possibility of survival. He was going to die. And he, here's Christ says, if you're going to be my disciple, you listen, you got you to hate your mom. You got to hate your dad. You got to uh, hate your wife. You got to hate your children. Yeah, you got to hate yourself. You say, well, that seems pretty extreme. You understand what he's asked for is, is love supreme for God himself. And everybody else is in second place, if you will. Everybody else is in third place. They're, they're way behind here. He says, I want your supreme love for me. That's what I want. And he says, just to prove it, you need to pick up your cross and die to yourself and go and let everybody know that you're going to be my disciple. That's not easy. He did not promise an easy life. He did not promise an easy way to be his disciple. Look with me. If you will, at verse 33, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. This, uh, uh, some, uh, some want to paint this picture that if you, if you choose to serve Christ, well, you're going, to, uh, you're going to have a full bank account. You're going to have a comfortable home. You're going to have the uh, newest and greatest uh, uh, wardrobe. And you're going to have a, a new car every year. And you're going to have this and that. And we, we, in our American culture, we have played that up. I wonder if the church at Jerusalem if they would even recognize the Christianity in 21st century America. It doesn't, he doesn't promise it's going to be easy. He doesn't promise it's going to be a, a wonderful experience, if you will, uh, in the world sense of things, if you become his disciple. Not everybody will be happy about your service. Nehemiah had those who were actively working against him, trying to undermine the building of the walls. Noah had those who were angry with his preaching as he warned them of the coming judgment. Elijah had those who had him on a wanted poster, dead or alive, preferably dead. 
Jeremiah had those who were constantly, consistently working against them. You read the adventures of the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, you find a man who is being stoned, who is being chased out of town, who is being uh, thrown in jail, who is being beaten, and over and over and over the things go on. And we look at those things and we say, my, why would anybody sign up for that kind of a lifestyle? And yet the Apostle Paul said, His grace is sufficient. I'd much rather endure those things and have the power of Christ upon me. There will be those who support you, but there will be times when you have to work alone. Elijah thought he was the only one at work for God. God had to remind him there were 5,000 who had not bent the knee. But how many was on Mount Carmel that day when he called fire down on his side? None. When Daniel stood for God, and even though he had the cane on his side, but they had already signed the decree, and they tried to set that up, he had men working against him. And whenever it came time for prayer time, guess who was the only one found praying? It was Daniel. There he was by himself. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We don't know what was going on with them, but we know this. Daniel was not in the scene at that time. We have no idea why or where he was at, but we do know those three young men had to make a choice. It came their time, and they decided to stand uh, there for God. Listen, you're not always going to be there on your, uh, be there with a crowd. Sometimes it just might be you all by yourself. You may be facing and staring down a lion's den, but it doesn't mean that God's forsaken you. I like what Hebrews chapter 11 says. It goes through and gives us the, uh, the way that many have overcome. He says that many over, over, uh, overcame the lions. They, they quenched the fire. He says, but there was others who chose not. They chose not. They, 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 they endured the terrible persecution that came. And listen, God does not lose sight of our service, and, and He desires to give us a reward. Can I give you real quick here just some principles tonight uh, of working for God? Four principles quickly here of working for God. Number one, don't worry about what you can get. Just be concerned about what you can give. Don't be, don't be caught up in what you're going to get. Just be concerned about what you can give. Look with me at Luke chapter 6 and verse number 38. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. <clears throat> Jesus says this, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Listen, God puts a, a desire. He said, I want you to, to do this, do that for me. Don't ask Him, well, how much, what am I going to get out of this, God? Don't, don't worry about that. Let Him take care of this. Here's what you'll find as you serve the Lord. He always does better than what you could ever give. Amen. Always has, always will. So don't go in and say, well, what's in it for me, God? Just say, God, what can I give to you? Lord, I only got a little bit here. I can't help but think of that little boy as he showed up that day to hear Jesus teach and preach and, and maybe see some miracles. And, you know, if you're like any, uh, any little boy, you want to see the show. I mean, I, I would be interested in wanting to see if I see some uh, crippled guy coming in and, and next thing I know I see him throwing his cane away and he's walking out. I want to see that. That would be pretty cool. And here he is. He's planning on bringing the sin in the whole, spending the whole day there and he's got his little lunch a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish in there. Man, he's ready. He's going to have fish sandwich at lunchtime, and he's ready to go. And now here they is. They, they say, we need some food. And, and the only guy, out of 5,000 men plus all those women and children, only one boy thought to bring something to eat with him. That is an amazing thing. But only one thought to bring it. And here it is. They say, can we have your lunch, young man? He gives his lunch over to the Lord. And what does God do with it? Feeds a multitude of people and they have 12 times left over what he started with. Yeah. Don't question what God can do. Just give God, say, here it is, God, whatever you can do with it, I want to be used by you. Yeah. When it comes to serving the Lord, don't come asking, Lord, uh, what can I get? Just be concerned about what can I give to you, Lord, here it is. Number two, don't demand a contract from God. Yes. Don't demand a contract from God. If you go back there to Matthew chapter number 20 with me, you'll find that that group who began the day, they had a contract. And they got what they deserved. They got what they agreed upon. But everybody else, if you notice, everybody else, in comparison to what those fellows got, they got more than what those guys. And I got that. Oh, they all got a penny. Everybody got a penny. 
But uh, you understand the hours given was less and less and less and less, and yet he gave uh, to each one of them a penny. Listen, he, he blessed those others. The others were blessed by what they received. The first were bitter. Why? Because they had made a contract. They made a contract. And listen, uh, uh, don't walk in saying, God, if you will do this and you will do that, uh, then uh, God, then I, I will do this and I will do that. Uh, by the way, God doesn't work in contracts. So don't even try to uh, get one set up there. If, you, you've, if you're busy trying to do that, you're going to limit what He can do for you. Yeah. And then furthermore, your motives are going to be wrong. Instead of serving Him out of love, you're going to serve Him out of what you can get. Yeah. That's not what the Lord wants. He wants our heart. Number three, don't assume that God or anyone else owes you anything. We live in a society that believes that everybody owes them something. We take them to court for this, that, and the other. And that's all we're after. Listen, don't come to God and say, well, God, I did this, 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 and this for you. Now you owe me. You don't have that attitude. Look again, Matthew chapter 20, verse 10. But when the first came, they supposed, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured. Oh, they got a bad attitude. They got a bad attitude because they assumed that God, or here the good man of the house, owed them more. But they signed the contract. They signed the contract. Number four. Number four, don't get jealous when God blesses somebody else. Don't get jealous when God blesses somebody else. As Cain watched God accept Abel's offering, he got jealous. And it caused him to take his own brother's life. Saul, as he saw the hand of God upon David, became jealous and tried to take David's life a number of times. Joseph's brothers saw the hand of God and the favor of God upon him, and they got jealous of Joseph and they tried to rid themselves of him, even though it would break their own dad's heart. The men of Ephraim in Judges chapter 8 became jealous of Gideon. They became jealous of him, and instead of rejoicing in the, uh, in, the, in the freedom that was gained by overthrowing the Midianites, instead they got angry with Gideon and they wanted to kill him. In the story of the prodigal son, we find the elder brother being jealous that his younger brother had a party. Jealousy. Listen, don't get jealous, man. If God blesses somebody else, praise the Lord that God blessed them. Amen. Thank God that they got blessed. You know what that tells me when I see God bless somebody else? It just reminds me of a good God that I have. Amen. It just reminds me I'm serving the right one along the way. And so I'm just going to keep my eyes peeled on Him. And I'm just going to try to keep my focus up there and say, Lord, help me to just follow you ever for the rest of my life. Yeah. The preacher of many years ago, W.B. Riley, wrote this in I thought it was an appropriate poem that he wrote, and it, it does sum up very well what we're looking at tonight. At dawn the call was heard, and busy reaper stirred. Along the highway leading to the wheat, Wilt thou reap with us, they said. I smiled and shook my head. Disturb me not, said I, my dreams are sweet. I sat with folded hands and saw across the lands, The waiting harvest shining on the hills. I heard the reapers sing their song of harvesting, and thoughts to go, but dreamed and waited still. The day at last was done, and homeward one by one the reapers went, well laden as they passed. There was no misspent day, not long hours dreamed away, and sloth that turns to sting the soul at last. A reaper lingered near. What? cried he, idle here? Where are the sheaves your hands have bound today? Alas, I made my reply, I let the day pass by, until too late to work I dreamed the hours away. O oh, foolish one, he said, and sadly shook his head, the dreaming soul is in the way of death. The harvest soon is o'er, rouse up and dream no more, act for the summer fadeth like a breath. What if the master came tonight and called your name? asking how many sheaves your hand had made. If at the Lord's command you showed your empty hands, condemned, 
your dreaming soul would stand dismayed. Filled with strange terror then, lest chance come not again, I sought the weed fields while others slept. Perhaps ere break of day the Lord will come this way, a voice kept saying, till with fear I wept. Through all the long still night among the wheat fields white, I reaped and bound the sheaves of yellow grain. I dared not pause to rest, such fear possessed my breast, so for my dreams I paid the price in pain. But when morning broke and rested reapers woke, my heart leaped up as sunrise kissed the lands. For came he sooner or late, the Lord of the estate would find me bearing not the curse of empty hands. The curse of empty hands. We all will stand before the Lord one day. He did not save us on this earth to live our lives here for ourselves. The writer of Ecclesiastes says this, that it is vanity. It is vanity. The Bible tells there in the book of Ecclesiastes that he sought to see what it would be like to live for himself. And that's exactly what he did. He lived for uh, wine, he lived for uh, play, he lived for uh, work, he lived for money, you name it, he lived for it. You read the book of Ecclesiastes and you'll find when it comes to the end of that book he has this summary. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. A life lived for self truly is vanity. God has left us here for the purpose to serve Him. Our service to Him should flow from a heart of love because of what He has done for us. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11 tells us that all things were created by Him and for Him. And the only place we're going to find satisfaction in life is whenever we choose to live our life for Him. That's the only place we're going to find satisfaction. Tonight, He's looking for those who will pick up an application and apply for the job. One more place to turn tonight and then we'll be done. Go with me to the book of Isaiah, if you will. Many of us know this reference here, but look at Isaiah chapter number 6. Isaiah was a prophet of the Lord already. He was doing the work of the ministry, if you will. But you will find here in this that, that there was a great move in Isaiah's life whenever his friend, the king Uzziah, died. If you look and you do some study, you'll find that Isaiah and Uzziah were very close. And just as there's a, just a heartbreak whenever somebody we know well passes away, no doubt Isaiah's heart was broken and he was needing some encouragement. And it was in that day that Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up and he was impressed by what he saw. He saw the angels around the throne there and they, he heard the echoes of holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. What an impressive sight that had to be. I can't even imagine what it would have sounded like as this morning as I listened to you all saying, Oh, come all you faithful. I just enjoyed hearing the voices rising up and no instruments at all. Just listen to this building get filled with those voices. And what an amazing thing. But can you imagine what it sounds like to have thousands of angels, thousands of saints around the throne of God singing His praises and singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. What an amazing sight. What an amazing thing that John got to see in Revelation. And what an amazing thing that Isaiah got to see. And as he heard those things and, and his heart was moved, I want you to see that God put forth a call. Verse number 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. The question goes out tonight. Who will go for us? He's looking for answers. And every one of us in here tonight, we will answer with either yes, I will go. Yes, Lord, I'll be used for you with you for however you have for me. Or, no, Lord, I'm too busy. I'm too busy living for myself. Continue with me there in verse number 9. He said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, 
but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Isaiah preach, but nobody will listen. Isaiah, go and proclaim the truth, but nobody will turn from their wicked ways. Boy, isn't that promising? If we don't see results, then we want to throw in the towel. Yeah. And what God says, just keep preaching. Right. I just need you to proclaim the Word of God. I need you to go forth and tell them what needs to be said. One more spot. Another verse just came to mind, so I'm going to go over there real quick. Ezekiel chapter 33. <coughs> Verse 30 says, And also thou, son of man, thy, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses, speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. And they come unto thee, and as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice, and can play well on an instrument, for they hear thy words, but they do them not. And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come, then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. God does not ask us to work for him necessarily for the results. He asks us to work for him to be faithful. That, that's all he wants. It is required in a steward that a man be found Faithful. Faithful. I want faithfulness. God says, I want faithfulness. Isaiah preach. He asks questions. For, for how long, Lord? Then they're going to hear it. He says, just keep preaching. Just keep preaching. Don't stop. Ezekiel, uh, Lord, I'm going to preach. And they're just going to take it in. They're going to say, oh, what a wonderful thing we've heard tonight. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, preacher, for what you preach. And uh, Lord, they're going to go out and they're going to ignore everything they said. And they're just going to uh, pass it off by. Lord, uh, how long should I put up with this? He said, just keep preaching. So they can hear this here said about them, you had a prophet. You had a witness. You had somebody to tell you the truth. And tonight there's somebody in your sphere, there's somebody in your place of influence that they may never darken the door of a church. And they may never pick up a Bible. And if you hand off a tract and they never may ever read that tract, but they will hear if you will tell them. If you'll be the servant that he's looking for in your field. He went to the marketplace. And he sought for those who are willing to work. Some of you are in the early years of your life. You're part of those who are in that first hour. And he wants you to give your life for him. Now, whether it's ministry or if it's just being a faithful Christian, wherever you find yourself at, just be faithful. Young people, just be faithful. Just decide tonight, I'm going to be faithful to the Lord. I remind you this here, Samuel was just a young boy, four years old, and he was faithful to serve the Lord. So there's no age limit. He just wants you to be faithful. Amen. Maybe you're in the third hour of life. you still got plenty of life ahead of you. You still have a lot to go. I mean, you, yes, there's a few years behind you, but for the most part, you've got another good 60, 70 years ahead of you. I want you just determine to serve the Lord. Determine to serve the Lord. You're middle aged. You're at noon. You're halfway through life. I don't know how the first half has gone. Maybe you've been like those who have sat in the marketplace and have just kind of messed around. You've got another half to go. Why don't you serve him with this half? Maybe you're further down the road than that. Maybe you're at the ninth hour. Maybe you're at the eleventh hour. Can I tell you? He doesn't care what hour you're at. What he wants is somebody to be willing to serve him. Amen. Yeah. So will you serve him tonight? To help one and sign is out. Let's not appear before him with the curse of empty hands. Let's give ourselves to serve Him. Father, help us tonight.